There are 24 factions in Warhammer 3, each with their own distinct mechanics, armies and playstyles, but the time has finally come to rank them from worst to best to see which is the greatest faction of all the factions in Immortal Empires. Leave your own ranking down in the comments below and let's get started. Coming in at 24th place and my award for the worst faction in Warhammer 3, we have Norska, and I doubt this will come as a surprise to many of you, although there's one of you which I know will be very upset. Norska have been slowly falling to the bottom of the list of factions since Warhammer 3 for some time, and in the new bigger map it's more obvious than ever that they need some love. To start off with, they have a really major lack of actual mechanics. Sure, they have Tribal Confederation, which is great and one of the most powerful mechanics in the game, but the rest of it is pretty rough. The allegiance to the Dark Gods can be decent, but honestly, they simply feel outdated, and they should do, since they're basically a Game 1 faction with only very minor changes since their DLC all those years ago. And on the fact they're now sandwiched between the Empire to the south and the many, many flavors of Chaos to the north, unless you start looking submissive and vassalable, you're going to be dominated whether you like it or not. In battle, they're fine, but they have a very basic roster that doesn't really offer much variety to build. I mean, they literally have a single Lord choice when you aren't using legendaries. If that doesn't scream how much they need an update, I don't know what does. They do have some strong areas like the monster variety, decent laws of magic and their high speed, but they still lack in a lot of areas, making them feel a bit like beta testing. Hopefully their rework is coming soon, as I think we have a fun faction here and they fit the chaos focus of game 3 perfectly, they just need some love to meet their potential. Coming in 23rd place and second to last, we have Bretonia. Moving south, we find yet another faction that was added in the final hours of Warhammer 3 and hasn't really seen significant changes since then. Now we have had the minor rework in the patch 3.1, which should make them a little bit better, but I still think they belong this low and no, it's not just personal bias, although that does come into a little bit. As we covered in the worst mechanics video, no matter if you're trying to use basic early game peasant units or elite cav, you're limited in what exactly you can recruit without bankrupting yourself. It's pretty hilarious how basically every mechanic in the faction works against you pretty much all the time before becoming useful right at the end of their lifespan. In battle, they're honestly a decent faction, if a little bit micro-intensive with the major cav focus. Of course, this is if you have a lord that can use those late game cav units or have a peasant capacity to use early ones. They're mobile and can do a lot of damage when mastered and literally run circles around enemies. There are factions that can also do this whilst being 10 times easier to play, but that is why these lads are so low on the list. Coming in 22nd place, we have the Dark Elves and what a fall from grace they have had in Warhammer 3. I'm not sure what CA were thinking, but somehow they are a whole lot worse than they were in Warhammer 2. Now take all of this with a fairly large grain of salt since from here on out, we're kind of into the mid tier. They're not terrible, just compared to everyone else, they're not all that great either. And on the fact that they are much worse in Warhammer 3 than Warhammer 2 because of some weird changes that they made, and that is why they are this low. They still have the slaves mechanic, but it's been good to the point that it's so much worse than it once was. Before you could farm them for infinite money at the cost of control. These days you can farm them to fill up a capacity for some minor improvements and spend them on a couple of other things to help you get moving. Black arcs are still pretty great for recruiting anywhere on the map near water, especially with the new sea lanes, and loyalty sucks just as hard as it always did. In Balb, they're not bad with a lot of high damage right out the gate alongside some tough armor and a mix of monsters and ranged. They're not amazing by any means, but if you can get behind their more aggressive playstyle, you should have a good time with it. Next up, we have the Vampire Counts. Now, are they higher than the Dark Elves because they're my favorite faction? A little bit. But also, their more limited mechanics, in my opinion, are still stronger than the now gutted Dark Elves. Raising the Dead has never been better, with so many battle sites clustering the map in the later game of Immortal Empires, and on the insane replenishment you get and you rarely find yourself lacking healthy units in game. Bloodlines are still super mid, but the choice of buffs and Immortal Lords are always nice. Plus, some of those effects can actually be pretty strong. Now yeah, you can't do the free zombies thing anymore, but you can still pretty easily flood the world with zombies or skeletons with their much stronger economy to take over the world from one of their now more varied starting locations. In battle, they're another faction that suffers from having only one playstyle, and that is Rush. They have no ranged outside of Bloodline units, so we have to close the distance between them and enemies to deal any damage. Against more ranged focused factions, this can feel incredibly painful, but once they make contact, they're pretty decent at dismantling most forces without too much trouble. In Warhammer 3, they have a lot more magical damage, so can take on resistance much better. Plus, they have one of the best laws of magic in the game in the lore of the vampires, so they're pretty top notch as far as that's concerned. If you're looking for a change of pace from the usual ranged troops behind melee that most other factions follow, they're a great choice for a more melee focused build. And if you haven't tried them since Warhammer 2, despite being this low, I think they've improved a lot in Game 3. Moving on now to the Ogre Kingdoms, following the tradition set by the Warriors of Chaos all those many, many years ago, the Ogres hit the scene as the pre-order bones for Warhammer 3, 
and are a pretty massive disappointment to say the least. Now, don't get me wrong, they're nowhere near as bad as the Warriors were for all those years, but they're just not great, especially considering how cool they should be. They just feel half-baked in pretty much everything. The meat mechanic is super basic, and the bonuses you get from it are mediocre at best. Ogre camps are cool and would make a lot of sense, but the weird capacity issues make them a bit more of a hindrance than they should be. Big names would be fine if they were more lore accurate and you could get all of them at once, and contracts are just pathetic side quests for meager rewards. There should be mercenary lords spanning the map with a network of camps allowing them to accept massive sums of gold to wipe out the green skins for the empire before turning on them for even more gold. Meat should be a mechanic like Grom with his cauldron, offering all kinds of bonuses depending on what he cooks. The foundations are there, they just need something on top of those to be great. In Baal, they're better, with a range of Ogre units playing alongside monsters with some Noblars, and they have a very distinct hit and run playstyle with their considerable girth. Some areas could use some padding to make them feel complete, but they're at least playable in the state they're in, so no real complaints here. If you like thick boys and lots of charging, you're probably going to have a lot of fun with the Ogres. Next we have the Demons of Chaos, and do we really need to go into detail? The ones secret final faction in Warmer 3 at launch are now one of the least interesting factions we have, and it's not even because there's only one Legendary Lord. It's because that Legendary Lord is the entire faction. Now, the Builder Demon system, while cool, is all the faction has. They get some minor mechanics from other branches of Chaos, but they're watered down so you might as well just play those other factions to get the full experience. They get the full Chaos roster, but so do the Warriors of Chaos, and they have other mechanics too. When you're focusing entirely on Daniel, the demons aren't that bad, but as soon as you're forced to use other armies, you realise how much they got forgot about. Add on the insult that Bellicor isn't a legendary lord choice, and it's clear not much thought was given to how the faction actually fits into the game outside of Daniel. Without him, there is no faction, and it's not a great place for a faction to be in. As I said, in battle they have the full rosters of all of Chaos, so they have a lot of choice in what to build, so it can have a lot of fun and variety there. But like I said, just play the Warriors of Chaos instead. You get the same roster, but some actual mechanics to go with it. Next, we have the Tomb Kings, and they haven't really changed since they hit the scene way back when, when their DLC came out, so it's impressive they managed to hold on to such a mid-level of power for so long. They have a very unique style of play, where they have very low expenses as well as passive income, so end up slowly building up into a snowball into the late game, when they can have massive armies full of powerful units without needing to pay for them. The books of Nagash offer them a nice side quest to go around the map collecting, and the Mortuary Cult gives them some fun crafting to do through all the game. The only real problem they have with their game play is it's pretty limited to the desert, so attempting to move out of it is a massive challenge as well as a little bit pointless. All their best lands are there with the Great Pyramids, so why would you go anywhere else? Unless you're Katep of course and you have no choice, poor fella. Honestly, it's hard to find lots to complain about for the Tomb Kings. Like I said earlier, we're into the mid-factions here, and that's what they are. Very middle-of-the-road decent, without being super overpowered in any area. The same can be said for Baal, where they have a decently varied roster, with lots of skeletons and constructs, for a cool undead feel, without ripping off the vampires. Just one generic lore type is a little bit sucky, but aside from that, the roster is a decent size, and has loads of units that are fun to use. The constructs and artillery are some of the coolest units to look at in-game, and bring the power just as much as the style. If you're into the vampire counts but want a few more ranged options, then these are a great pick to scratch that undead itch. Next we have Cathay. I don't really rate them very highly, as is pretty obvious by their position. Honestly, the most powerful thing about this faction is the Legendary Lords, and as we said with Daniel, that isn't enough. Your faction needs to be able to stand on its own without Legendary Lords. Now thankfully, they do have other mechanics aside from just the Lords, but they're nothing all that special. The Great Bastion is just waves of chaos throwing themselves at you periodically giving you babysitting duty for the northern area of Cathay. Harmony makes building up your faction into a faff with every aspect needing to lean to one side or the other to keep things moving optimally. The compass is alright, but it's just a set of four buffs, so nothing massively interactive there. And the Ivory Road is also alright, but it's a very generic mechanic that's already been stolen by the Chaos Dwarves, and honestly, it makes a lot more sense for them, and they do it better. I also think that this is the way training should be done by every faction, but that is a separate conversation entirely. They're not necessarily a very weak faction, but they are very bland, and if you ask me, that's almost worse. In battle, they're a little bit more exciting with lots of gunpowder and some pretty fun laws of magic, but again the lords are some of the most exciting and most powerful units and you get one per faction, which makes all other armies feel a little bit lacking. If you like blowing stuff up en masse and sturdy front lines, then they're a decent pick. They're kind of like an alternate to the Empire, but with a little more monster versatility and a lot less units. Coming next, we have Slanesh, and if you listen very, very carefully, you can probably hear the Great Book of Grudges screaming at this placement, but I just don't think Slanesh are all that great. Now yes, I do have to address the seduction mechanic because it is pretty good, and I should also quickly mention that we're now getting towards the factions that I would also consider to be pretty good. Seduction can let them make friends with and eventually vassalize basically any faction in game, which can be super strong when pulled off against a very powerful enemy, but isn't it a lot easier and also more cost efficient to just wipe out the faction entirely and have all the gold that those lands make for yourself like any other faction in the game? 
I mean, it is a cool gimmick and for role playing purposes, I get it, but practically I find it a little bit pointless. Seducing units pre-battle, however, is pretty fun, turning enemies against themselves, and devotees and disciple armies aren't too bad, and everybody loves a cult. In battle, Slanesh is another faction that is very strong, but only if you can play them right. With all their cav and chariots, they can end up being a micromanagement nightmare as you have to stay on top of units and keep them moving to get your value. Their roster is decent and powerful as well as their unique lore of magic, but they're just a bit harder to use than most, making their average efficacy for your average player a lot less than optimal. If you like hit and run and lots of cavern chariots and a few monsters, then you'll probably have a lot of fun here. And coming on top of Slanesh, so it's, wow, that is not how that meant to come out. And next we have Nurgle. I mean, you know I had to do it to him. Honestly, for me, Nurgle and Slanesh are probably pretty much tied in terms of power, but I just had to put Nurgle ahead for a couple of reasons. First up, personal bias, it's my list. Secondly, he's a lot easier to use in a lot of aspects. On the campaign side, his mechanics are super unique and it can be a lot of fun. Crafting and spreading plays gives you all sorts of bonuses and can seriously change the outcome of a battle if you use the right combination of symptoms. Their unique cyclical buildings make them a very weird faction to build up settlements as and can make them feel a lot slower than some other factions early on. Once you do have a few cycles going on, however, recruitment pools fill up and you can recruit full armies in a single turn if you have enough gold. Of course, you also have corruption and cults like any other branch of chaos and they're all on brand with Nurgle and offer various bonuses that work perfectly with the playstyle. In battle, it is a very weird playstyle, with almost everything being super slow, but also super tanky, meaning you can take a beating, get into enemies, but you'll still have lots in the tank when you make contact. The addition of some of the Warriors of Chaos has made them a lot better, but by far the best thing about the army is poison. Nearly every unit has it, and it makes taking on basically anything way easier. It kind of drags any unit down to your level, and really feels like the inevitable march to death that Nurgle is all about. They're mainly melee based, but have a couple of very powerful ranged units, however limited they might be. Of course, there's also the lore of Nurgle and some pretty great monsters, so if you're into the death and decay vibe, they play the part pretty perfectly. Next, we have the Vampire Coast, and quite like the Tomb Kings, the Vampire Coast haven't really seen too many changes since their launch, but that doesn't mean that they're bad by any means. They can be incredibly strong and it's really down to just a couple of mechanics. Their ship building borrows from the Black Arcs but just makes their legendary lords into roaming recruitment machines no matter where they are on the map, meaning you can be deep into enemy lands, miles from the nearest settlements or even water and get a full stack of Necrofex if you really want to. Add this to the Pirate Coves where you can leech income from powerhouse settlements and use that to fund massive armies without ever really needing proper settlements. And you can take settlements too for pure income purposes to print gold without needing to worry about recruitment. Not every mechanic is a hit, of course, with Infinite and the Piece of Eight feeling a little bit underwhelming compared to the rest, and don't even get me started on loyalty. By far though, the thing the Vampire Counts nail is theming. When you play as them, you really feel like you're playing as a faction of undead pirates. This extends into battle with their roster of gunpowder and monsters, all with that beautiful undead source layered on top for even more perfect theming. With these guys, you don't need front lines, since you can sling so much lead at enemies, they won't be able to see your army for all the smoke. Never mind survive to take them out. Crank up the shanties and take to the seas. If you like undead pirates, this is the faction for thee. Next up we have the Wood Elves, and the Wood Elves have arguably one of the best glow ups the game has ever seen to date. Long were they one of the worst factions you could ever hope to play, these days they're incredibly strong at what they do, and what they do is very specific. With the magical forest now spread across the entire map, they're more global than ever with their deep roots allowing them to zip around the map in a single turn to take over every forest on the map for massive rewards. Being limited to the forest doesn't mean anything outside of them is next to impossible as well as basically pointless, so you are locked into one very specific playstyle every time you play as them. But that playstyle of taking over a forest and then cleansing the area around it, they do it very well. And the bonuses they get from having all these forests cleansed and awakened stack up fast and make them into a real snowball that's next to impossible to stop. In battle, they rely mostly on their super powerful archers to sneak around and dismantle armies before they even know what's hitting them combined with powerful tree spirits and monsters to disrupt and terrify anything that remains. If you're into skirmishing and a very aggressive playstyle of all attack with little defense, these might just be the faction for you. The Lizard Men are somehow simultaneously the faction with the most DLC content, but also the faction that needs a rework possibly the most. Their base mechanics, before you get anything interesting from Lords, are very bland and don't really give them much help until much later into the game. So why are they so high? Well, despite their basicness, they still somehow manage to be a pretty strong faction. Their DLC Lords, with the exception of one special little guy, are pretty strong, especially Gorok, who manages to be exceptionally strong whilst also being exceptionally free. Wacky stuff. In battle, they have their real strength, and that comes from their truly massive roster. Before Chaos had their massive undivided roster, the Lizards had the biggest roster by far, and a wide range of units within that roster. They have massively tanky front lines, sneaky skirmishes, speedy cav, and of course, a nice helping of monstrous dinos in all shapes and sizes. 
If you like overwhelming enemies with sheer mass and power, then few do it better than the Lizards and have so much to choose from when doing it. They're also one of the best looking factions in the game, but that's just me. If the campaign was as feature dense as the roster, they'd be truly unstoppable. But as is, they're pretty good without being overpowered. Similar to the Lizards, the High Elves base mechanics are pretty mediocre. At least they give them some assistance pretty much all game, rather than just at the end of it. Influence for Lords and Heroes seems like a bad deal until you see some of the effects the more elite characters can bring. Plus, there's hardly too many things to spend it on since Intrigue at Court is about as interesting as Historical Total Wars. At least their lords have decently varied mechanics and even start locations with High Elves mainly concentrating on the donuts, but some of them spreading across most of the map for a bit of variety. Of course, in battle, High Elves are best known for a single unit, and that is of course the Sisters of Avalon. These ladies are hilariously overpowered, always have been, probably always will be. Most ranged infantry in the faction will fall into the very strong side of things, and while most lack much armor piercing, their range is unmatched at basically every stage of the game. They complement this with a decent array of sturdy front lines, a handful of monsters, and some powerful calf. If you're a new player to Total War and want a good faction to pick up and learn, High Elves have always been my recommendation. They're not too deep, so it's not very confusing, and their armor is easy to use with a very laid back strategy. They're not the most exciting faction in the game, but they're decently strong and a beginner's dream. Next we come to the Dwarves, another game one faction, and this one has actually seen some changes with minor reworks here and there, but they could still use some love to get them on the same level as the others. In campaign, they're all about finding grudges and settling them by any means necessary. As is, the current system is very forgiving, since having a lot of grudges doesn't really have a massive penalty, so you can kind of just play and ignore grudges for the most part. Aside from this, they have their forge with all kinds of powerful items, including their unique runes, which can give them some added strength. As for legendary lord mechanics, there's nothing too crazy with Belagar's quest for 8 peaks and Thorax's item collection offering some nice but not essential buffs and bonuses. In battle, dwarves are one of the easiest factions to pick up and play since they are the best turtling faction in the game. They have a very slow moving roster paired with massive ranged firepower in their artillery and of course ranged infantry. Their front lines are super tough and their leadership is nearly unbreakable, so they can sit up in a corner and pick armies apart before they even get close against insurmountable odds. If you struggle with Micro, then they are a great faction to pick up and play, with very little gameplay needed during battles. Kislev are kind of like the Empire of Warhammer 3, since they're meant to be the go-to faction when you first pick up the game with a prologue, but honestly, I feel like they're one of the tougher Game 3 factions to get your head around. Once you do understand how they work and everything gets going, they are actually pretty strong, but getting to that point can be a rocky road. So, their mechanics are all pretty useless in the early game, with none of them really offering any bonuses to get you started. You have Devotion, which you don't really have that much of early on, so can't easily get bonuses from that. You have Supporters, which you need to grind to get bonuses on whilst also beating the AI. You have Atomans, which you don't even pick up until you take over another province, and they don't have any buffs until you pick up a few skills. And you have the Ice Core, which takes a lot longer to produce Lords and Heroes that admittedly will be more powerful right out the gate, but you're going to be waiting longer to get a hold of them, and you have to pay a lot more gold. Once everything is up and running, all these things give you lots of buffs and bonuses and can make your campaign much easier. It's just getting to that point takes a long time, and until then, you'll be struggling with not much help from anything else, or whilst being the wall keeping chaos out of the old world, and you don't even have an actual wall unlike some other factions. In battle, their roster is pretty versatile with a lot of hybrid weapons units, meaning you can spam almost anything and be effective in melee as well as ranged. That being said, being jacks of all trades, leave them feeling a little bit like masters of none, with many units feeling underwhelming in one or both of these areas. Of course, they have bear cav, so that's pretty rad, and yeah, they're also pretty strong, and have some great laws of magic on their side, so it all evens out. I don't think they're one of the easier factions to pick up and play, especially in Mortal Empires, but once you're comfortable with the game, they can be a great stepping stone to harder factions since they require a lot of maintenance to stay at their eventually high power level. Going from the new version of the Empire to, well, the actual Empire. Ever since they reworked with Marcus, I felt the Empire have been a nearly unstoppable faction in the Auditide, and while they're not quite as powerful when played by the AI these days, you can still dunk on AIs pretty easily when you take the reins. Now, the main power of the Empire comes from Imperial Authority and Prestige, and hilariously, Two of their legendary lords can't even make use of this. This allows you to build up fealty with the other empire factions in the old world and confederate them all under one banner, with very few repercussions on yourself. Festus being in the middle of the empire does mean some factions get wiped out early, but all that means is you can chain res them for easy fealty and collect those semi-legendary lords and summon the elect counts even faster. Now the two lords that don't have this system, Marcus has always had a rough time and that's still true here. Orkmar isn't as bad, but he certainly does not have it as easy as he did when he was a Reichland boy. The army of the Empire is similarly strong and it's all about versatility. They really do have something for almost any occasion, with strong front lines damaged, powerful ranged infantry, explosive artillery and war machines, and of course, powerful and even monstrous calf. The only thing they lack is actual monsters to beef up those front lines, but you don't really need them. Now, are they the most beginner-friendly faction? 
Probably not. Some of their mechanics are a little bit fiddly on the campaign side of things. But if you're coming from historical, then they are just about the closest thing you can get to Empire 2. So you might as well enjoy it until then. Next up we have Siege, and Siege might just be in second place for the faction whose mechanics fit best with the theme, since when you play as them, you're literally just meddling with the strings of fate and partaking in moderate amounts of trolling. They can teleport around the map, move winds and magic around own regions as you please, and do all manner of wacky things with the changing of the ways. You can literally just steal settlements and there is zero counterplay to be seen. It's hilarious. Add on to this the usual cults and manifestations of chaos, and you have a faction with a surprisingly large number of mechanics have been added on launch. On the army side of things, Siege really benefited from the Wars of Chaos units being added to their repertoire and giving them a lot more options for front lines. They're the most ranged focus of the Monogod faction with a lot of options for all stages of the game and types of enemy. And of course, since it's chaos, there's tons of demons and monsters to keep things interesting. Since it's Siege, there's also plenty of magical power. So if you like fire explosions and chaos in one of its truest forms, these are a great faction for you. Another faction to have had a glow up semi-recently as far as content drops is concerned is the Beastmen. Once the worst faction by far, and now one of the best. The Beastmen are one of the few true horde factions left in the game, and they make the most of that fact. None of their units cost recruitment or upkeep, meaning all of your gold can be poured into horde buildings to recruit the most powerful armies you possibly can in your quest to raise the world. Their Herdstones mechanic keeps things moving and interesting, giving you some direction other than just raising everything in sight in exchange for marks of ruination. Dread is also earned constantly to upgrade the faction and increase unit capacity to fuel those late game units as well as confederate the other beasts. And all of this is under the ever present time pressure of bestial rage, meaning you have to keep battling to fill the bar and keep your army performing at peak. In battle, there are few factions that do hit and run better with their high speed and packed monster roster, making running over most foes into a breeze. They have mass and speed seen in few other factions and can use monsters in some extremely creative ways to get the most out of them. If you can get behind the constant focus on attacking and fighting and lack of settlement gameplay, it can be a very fun faction to just turn your brain off and return to Monkey. Next up we have Khorne, and honestly the Khorne and the Beastmen are pretty close in my mind since they essentially have the same gameplay loop of constantly fighting to maintain momentum, but Khorne is going higher since they feel like more of a complete faction alongside this. For one, they can take settlements and have a very unique method of doing so to keep up with their trail of destruction. Piling the Skull Throne higher and higher gives you excellent bonuses to keep moving, and they of course have the usual manifestations and calls to round them out. In battle, they keep the focus on attack with a great mix of demons and warriors that focus entirely on damage outputs with little regard for their own lives. You have great front lines, monsters, carve, and even one of the coolest artillery units in the game. Plus, they're the only faction in the game that gets stronger when used with the Blood Pack, so that's some extra value right there individual performance may vary. Coming in fourth place, we have the Warriors of Chaos, and here we have the most recent glow up, and it might just be the best one yet, on top of being the longest wait. The Warriors of Chaos experience changes a lot depending on your Lord, but at their peak, you have a truly massive roster of units to choose from, and a ton of powerful effects and gifts from all the branches of Chaos. Their new Dark Fortress and Vassalization system is great and gives them actual lands and allies to work with. The Warband upgrades mean you now have a reason to stick with those high level Marauders instead of disbanding them the second you get something better. The Paths to Glory make all your generic characters super powerful and can transform them in many ways if you do everything right. Top it all off with some Dark Authority to make everything cheaper and heal faster, and you have a damn powerful faction. As I said, in battle, you have a huge undivided roster as well as the OG Warriors of Chaos units, plus a tide of new units from all areas of the Chaos Pantheon. You have a ton of front lines to choose from, plenty of cab and chariots, and then a shed load of monsters of all shapes and sizes and colours to keep things interesting. Honestly, their roster is so large and in charge that you'll struggle not to find something that works for you. They're still not the easiest faction in the game, but once you get going with them, they can be easily one of the strongest. The Greenskins have- Nah, I'm just joking. In third place, getting on the podium, we have the Greenskins. The Greenskins have been a powerhouse ever since their rework all those years ago, and transferring them to the new map hasn't really done much to the kneecap their power. They can still use Tribal Confederation to conquer most of the map in the matter of turns, they can still use their Wars to double the army size at no cost to themselves, and they can still use the mountain of scrap they collect from battling to make their units even better. This is before you even mention specific Lord mechanics like the ever-balanced Grom's Cauldron. In battle, they're another entirely attack-focused faction with an almost exclusive focus on melee in every aspect of their roster. The melee infantry are big and hit like a truck, monsters are even bigger and hit like a bigger truck, and the few ranged units they have also hit like a big truck. I'm keeping it short because green skins are just that simple. If you like to always be fighting, then look no further. Yeah, they might have the most intelligent battle strategy, but who cares when you can roll over most armies before they can act on any of those so-called strategies. Coming in second place, we have a Chaos Dwarves. Wow, newest faction and they're one of the strongest? Call me surprised. Now, it's no secret that the newest faction's Warmer 3 often feels super strong, but the Chaos Dwarves, they really are just that good. Their campaign is one that's a little bit finicky to get going, but once it does, man oh man does it get going. The supply chain of labor, raw materials, and armaments can produce insanely quickly as well as produce you a mountain of gold here and there. Add on the trading convoys and you can print pretty much whatever currency you want and have whatever units you want in your armies. 
The Hellforge being a limitation quickly changes into it being a superpower, as you buff units like almost no other faction can. In Bal, they're kind of like the regular dwarves, but somehow better once you get the capacity sorted. At peak performance, you have high damage and extremely tough front lines, massive burst damage ranged, high speed and devastating war machines, and probably the best artillery lineup in the game. All of this does come at a cost, however, like actual cost, we've been through this. I may not agree with the capitalism surrounding this faction, but I can't deny their obscene power level that can only be rivaled by one damn faction that just won't shift from their place at the top. Yeah, it's the Skaven, and it's no surprise these guys are still the most powerful faction, I should really just come out and say it, Icky is carrying them, still, after all these years. Because when you play as him, not only do you have the ambushing, undercities, food and corruption working for you that all the other Skaven have, you also have actual uranium bombs and can do comparable buffs to the Chaos Dwarves, but there's no capacity prices or maintenance. Just one quick hit of warp fuel and food and bam, infinite ammo, rattling guns for the rest of the game and that's only naming one upgrade. It's too funny how overpowered this mechanic is and it catapults a faction that's strong but not crazy into one that's so stupidly overpowered it almost takes the fun out of it. Now yes, only Ikit can use this, so if you're talking about the median power of the Skaven then they're probably a lot lower. But we're using mean and this outlier is affecting our data pretty damn hard. In Bal, the Skaven are a nightmare, no matter what you go up against, with great units in pretty much every category. Late game, they have super tough and high damage front lines, powerful weapons teams to take out all kinds of targets, grotesque monsters in all shapes and sizes, and devastating war machines and artillery to take out any opponents. It's hard to find a weakness in a Skaven army at peak performance. Early on, they are weak, but who isn't? Very few factions have a spike as spiky as the Skaven, so there's no doubt in my mind that they're still the best faction in Warmer 3. And that is the list, let me know your ranking down in the comments below, like, subscribe, and if you want to know which factions have the most overpowered mechanics in the game, then check out this video here, where I go over the top 10.